I'd like to introduce you to Nicole Howell, goes by Nikki, <laughs> or Mickey, <laughs> or Mickey, as my son calls her. Um, Nicole is a fantastic pediatric occupational uh, therapist. Um, she's done a lot of work with children that have a variety of needs, uh, sensory processing problems, learning difficulties. Um, so I think you're going to find her talk extremely useful. Um, and that is going to follow, be followed up by Anissa's talk. So enjoy. Thank you. Welcome to my presentation. Um, we are so excited to be here. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about a brief introduction um, into occupational therapy. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you know about OT, has had their little one in, or child in occupational therapy? Okay. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. It's just good to know. So there you go. So this is the World um, Federation of Occupational Therapy's definition of what we do. And um, I'm going to read it out, but it's um, as a client-centered health profession concerned with promoting health well and well-being through occupation. The primary goal of occupational therapy is to enable people to participate in activities of everyday life. Occupational therapists achieve this outcome by working with people and communities to enhance their ability to engage in occupations they want to, need to, or are expected to do, or by modifying the occupation or the environment to better support their occupational engagement. Okay, so lots going on there, but what I love, and I've broken it down to the two words that we use to describe ourselves, which is we use occupational, and that's really the participation, as we said, in, in meaningful activities of everyday life. Um, and then the therapy part is really we are, we're, we, our aim is to promote health and well-being among the individuals that we work with, um, and also to enhance the abilities that um, they have, whether it means by literally working with them in a clinic setting or a school-based setting in this case, or whether it's through modifying things that we need to modify, looking at the environment, seeing how we can adjust things. So it really is quite broad, but the whole purpose of it is to help someone engage meaningfully in their everyday tasks that they want, need, or are expected to do. Okay, so. That's a great definition. How does it relate to children? Okay, so obviously we know that children's main occupation is learning and playing. We've gone, they've, um, all the presenters have done such a great job of ex explaining, you know, the role of how difficult it can be sometimes with learning and barriers to learning. And then we take that and we figure out how to help and assist where we can or how do we modify and adapt. Okay, so OTs, we specifically, our type of occupational therapy that we do at Sensational Kids work within schools and at our clinic setting um, with children who have additional needs. And um, mostly we look at helping achieve developmental milestones, learning within the classroom setting, play. Obviously, it's the most important part. Children learn through play. Play is a fantastic way um, that we actually use not just to help them learn to play, but we use it as a way and a means to help them learn as well as well as looking at sensory processing too. So when we get a referral and someone comes and needs support from us, we always start with an assessment. And assessments are carried out because that's the best way for us to, just, to figure out what is the baseline that the little one is currently presenting with. So what, what are their challenges? What are their participation challenges in their occupations, whether it be in their learning, meeting their milestones, their play, um, their everyday activities, which is what we call ADL, so things like feeding, dressing, um, toileting as well. And then we do comprehensive assessment to evaluate all of these skills. Um, so looking at their motor skills, their sensory processing, their visual perception, um, their cognitive development. And then from there, that is, it enables us, like I said, to draw up what are their strengths, what are their challenges, and from there, how can we help them? How does, how does that, what it really gives us the picture for intervention. Okay, so then we give feedback to parents, to schools, um, to help guide them in terms of what they can do as well. And then we work on the intervention part. And intervention is extremely collaborative in, um, well, where we work at Sensational Kids. I think we really do believe in working with parents and schools um, or any setting that the learner is in to help them thrive. 
Okay, so we can do direct therapy, we can do group sessions, we do training as well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, intervention, I mean, so strategies for both home and for school, and that really encompasses sort of the whole, whole approach of what we do in um, occupational therapy. Okay, so if we have to break it down and look a little bit more, um, as I said, we look at gross uh, motor skills, so gross motor skills being the first one that we address. So our gross motor skills um, are our large muscles in our body. So they have included some pictures, you know, walking, skipping, hopping, balancing, um, to more complex skills. Then you start getting your riding your bikes, et cetera, et cetera. And typically these build upon each other. So they develop at certain ages and then they build, right? So we know, you know, you've got to sit first and then, you know, we get rolling over and we get crawling and then walking, et cetera, et cetera. So these all build upon each other. Okay, and delays in, in gross motor um, abilities can have an impact on school-related activities as well as a, a child's ability to in, interact with their environment. Um, so things like being able to sit at a desk, being able to read, write, can all be impacted by difficulties and delays with gross motor skills. Okay, so many act different activities outside of school can also be affected by gross motor delays, as I've spoken about. So it can also look at affecting their ability to dress, using the toilet, um, eating even. You know, if you're, if you're struggling with holding yourself upright, then eating can also some, you know, become a challenge. So we often see that delays um, in these skills can impact quite a lot of areas of a child's development, okay? Then we also know um, that our, a delay in gross motor skills may impact their finer finger and fine motor skills, which we'll get to now. Um, so there can be a delay in both of the areas as well, more often than not. And um, you can divide the skills of gross motor skills into your locomotor skills. So that's moving your body from one place to another, getting up, walking, coming back, manipulative and stability skills. So that looks at more of your, you know, your balance, your postural control, which we'll chat a little bit about now as well. So um, those are sort of the two that we look at mostly in occupational therapy. And then I think what's really important to note is, is when we're doing these assessments and when we're treating, it's very specific to the child. Whatever level they're at is what we work. We work from there. And I think it's really important to remember that, that it's not, you know, we, we look at it, it's not necessarily, yes, we need to know what is the norm for that, for that age group, but what is the child currently presenting with, and then how can we help them, you know, push as much as we can to, to work within those skills and build on them. So how can we help? Very generally, I think, again, it's difficult to, to um, pinpoint exactly because it depends on the need of the child. We know with um, ACC, it can look very different. It, everyone has different profiles, but generally speaking, um, we do things and we can encourage things like catching and throwing with different balls. So we can use large balls or small ones or bean bags, um, jumping and hopping. We can encourage balancing, you know, going to the park and balancing across the beams and holding their hand, getting them the confidence that they need in OT. We do it as well. Um, it's really about building confidence in the skill where we can, getting outside as much as possible and using equipment where you have it, if it's there, um, and accessing equipment outside um, so that they can learn to climb up the jungle gym, go down the slide. Those are all wonderful apparatus to use um, for your child to be able to help develop their gross motor skills. Obviously helping them engage and you know, exposing them to different sports um, is a lovely one. Football is a go-to in therapy as well, as it is, I'm sure, um, for lots of parents where their kids love using football as a tool to encourage gross motor skills. And then, like I said, working on core and shoulder girdle um, activities, which we'll touch on now as well. So, Having a strong core and, and a good posture will helps with stable posture, and it's the foundation for higher level skills. Okay, so um, balance, coordination, reading, writing, listening, learning. The minute you are able to hold yourself upright, all of a sudden you are able to interact with your environment so much more. Um, postural muscles develop um, the moment we are born and continue to be utilized in everyday activities that we need. Children who have reduced physical activity often have limited postural stability, which is why exposure is so important and why we need to 
help them and expose them at their level. Obviously, you know, I'm very aware of, like I said, that there, this is, it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, it's very specific and it needs to be individualized, which is where the therapeutic intervention comes in and, and, being, and working with the occupational therapist to say, okay, well, this is where we're at. How do we build on these skills you know, based on what your child's profile is um, and not necessarily comparing them to other norms or other children as well? I hope that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so children who... Um, Sorry, we spoke about that already. So things you can do at home, like I said, very dependent, but things like wheelbarrow walking in the picture over there, walking like a bear, um, balancing games. I love the game where you, you know, put out some cushions and obviously not your best ones, but then they want to walk across the cushions. Um, the floor is lava is always a brilliant game to play. Everyone loves that. <laughs> um, and any postural and stability activities. Uh, we do have some handouts that I'm sure we can um, not yeah, we can email across um, that do have more postural and um, shoulder stability activities if anyone would like those. Okay, so now we move on to focusing on a bit more of the fine motor skills. So fine motor skills is the coordination of muscles, bones, and nerves to produce small intact movements. So I want you to think really, this is about the hands, okay? And an example is picking up small items with your index finger, um, which is this one over here, and your thumb, and being able to pick them up. Um, a child with, any, with fine motor delays may have difficulties with everyday tasks such as writing, tying their shoelaces, using scissors, etc. And to develop good fine motor skills, we've got to have good hand and arm sensory awareness, which we're going to go through each of these now, upper limb strength, coordination skills, and fine finger movements. So you can see with upper limb strength, what we'd also want to see is good core strength and good ability to hold themselves upright and have stability. So that's why we need the gross motor skills as well to be able to help the more finer movements too. So to help a child with fine motor skills, um, we again, we said we need hand and arm awareness, sensory awareness. So we do these through encouraging um, sensory awareness with a bowl of rice, with pasta. It doesn't have to be cooked pasta. It can be raw pasta probably encourage that um, to start. <laughs> it can be pretty messy. <laughs> uh, beans, which is great. I find beans an awesome one to start, especially if they're a little bit averse to, to touching things. The beans are great. They're a little bit heavier. They feel a bit, you know, they're not as light on their skin, so they generally go for it more. And they can get the child to describe how they feel. They can find objects inside. You can get, you can hide things in a pillowcase and then they've got to put their hand in and figure out what they've got in there, take some of their toys and put it in. And you're really creating awareness here. And I love um, working with, you know, the idea of creating sensory awareness around your arms and hands because I think um, Anissa will touch more on the sensory side of things. But sensory, it, we are sensory beings. That's how we it's really how every human being learns, right? So creating something that's sensory rich by using things like these activities and, and also even the gross motor activities that, we were, that I touched on earlier, those are all what we call sensory rich activities. Now, um, earlier, we, um, they briefly touched on the, the concept of neuroplasticity um, and the idea that neuroplasticity um, can help the brain compensate in ways um, to deal with the fact that there isn't, you know, that, that there's this agenesis of the corpus callosum and using these activities that you can do at home or you can reach out and, you know, obviously there's the need for intervention, but doing these sensory rich activities at home really will help the brain create and figure out how to use these, you know, how do I use my hands? How do I use both of my hands together? Because now there isn't that, you know, because we're missing that inter um, integration or interaction with the hemispheres, we need to figure out different ways. And that's the brain will use these sensory rich activities that you're providing to do that, um, which is really awesome. And that's again where, the ther where therapy can guide you. And the therapist should be guiding you on, okay, your little one really enjoys this, keep going with that. It's motivating for them. It's, it's, it's rich in all these sensory, um, you know, all the ways that we need it to be rich. So keep going with that because you're going to lay down more ability to figure out how to use their bodies and their hands in functional activities like eventually reading, well, writing, cutting with both hands, et cetera, et cetera. There's, yeah. So that's why the sensory side of things I think is really awesome um, to use. So 
Um, another thing with the sensory is just to occlude vision where you can. It becomes a lot more tricky <laughs> for them. And they've really got to tap into the sensory systems there. They've got to tap, tap into that tactile system. And it's a lot more thinking and, and creating awareness around those, those hands. Um, so like I said, upper limb strength also being a really important part of this. Um, and that taps into a different sensory system as well, um, which Anissa will go into more detail with. But yeah, you want to, like bear walking, swimming being an amazing one to do as well. Um, I really feel that swimming is just an incredible way to help um, children of, you know, all different diagnoses, ages, stages. It's really, really great um, to help them ball skills. Um, board, board games, doing push-ups for some of them as they are slightly older and more, more encouraged to do it. Um, manipulating putty, so I don't know if you've ever heard of TheraPutty, but it's a great go-to that we use in OT and it is a wonderful sensory rich tool that we use to also, um, they, they manipulate it, they find hidden um, things inside the putty, so we often put little items in and they've got to go digging for it. And that's a lovely way to not just help with the upper limb strength, but it actually is a very sense, it's a lovely sensory awareness activity as well. And then we have a thing called um, Mr. Tennis Ball, which we do have a handout for as well that we can send across if anyone's interested in how to create a Mr. Tennis Ball. But it's basically a tennis ball, we cut, slit, and then Mr. Tennis Ball eats a whole bunch of different things, little marbles and gems and pom-poms, and you're really working lovely, getting some lovely input into the hands as well. Okay, and then we look at those coordination skills as well. So these are the higher level skills, okay, that need to be in place. Um, so things like artwork, typing, card games, finger soccer, using not nuts and bolts and tweezers, hammers, threading, so you can see there that this is where it might become a little bit more tricky for, for some of the children with ACC. And this is where your therapeutic intervention is really going to help guide you on, okay, well, how big should the beads be? Yes, my child can't bead at all. It's just way too difficult, but we're using tiny beads. Okay, well, let's use bigger ones. Let's use thicker, rope, I mean, thicker string, for example. So the OT can grade the activity so that the child is actually successful in completing it. They're not cutting very well with these scissors. Okay, let's try different ones. Let's make it the line thicker for them to cut out. Let's cut along a line before we cut on the circle. So um, I think that the, the role of the occupational therapist here becomes quite really, really important to, to help decide how to navigate this and, and how to build on skills based on that. Again, we're creating sensory rich ways that the child is successful in completing the tasks. We don't want them to be frustrated. That's not the point. So if it's not working, we find a way to, to change it, to be different, to adapt, to modify. Um, and, and that's where we get to be really creative as, as occupational therapists, which is extremely fun. Um, Another thing that um, we put down here is obviously in um, with fine motor and gross motor skills and all of our skills, we want to develop the crossing of the midline. So which is really the ability to use your limbs um, and your body and cross down the imaginary line of your body. Now, as we know, if we're struggling with the hemispheric communication, we're going to see a midline crossing difficulty in terms of the actual, so if you can imagine an imaginary line, okay, can I cross over from one side of my body to the other and use both sides of my body in a coordinated way. If I can't do that, how am I going to use my knife and fork to cut? How am I going to use my hand and stabilize the page and write a sentence? How do I hold the page and cut along the line but know when to turn the page as well? So we're, you're seeing those functional challenges and we're saying, okay, well, this is the why. These are the components that are sort of lacking or delayed that need to be built on and we can work on it and if we're seeing progress, that's amazing because of what we know about neuroplasticity, it's not impossible to see that. Or we go, look, it's still a real big challenge. Maybe we need to adapt. Maybe we need to modify. And that's where we would figure out. But really encouraging that midline crossing is going to encourage some ability. And as we know, as we said, that there are some areas where, yes, the, ACC, the, the corpus callosum might be absent in the brain, but are there other places that we can get some hemispheric communication and then using that to try and drive that through crossing the midline, working over my body as well. Okay, does that, is everyone with me, make sense? Cool. So Anissa's gonna 
come and talk more about the sensory side of things um, that we do. So I've touched on it briefly, but Anissa has had many, 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 many years experience in this, and she's absolutely incredible. Um, and, and yeah, I've learned everything I through her. I say all of that, so it's fine. <laughs> so she's gonna touch more on the sensory processing side of things as well. Okay. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so my name is Anissa, and just a little bit of background. Um, I have um, a 21-year-old now who has autism. I have a 19-year-old who has sensory difficulties. Um, I have two dogs and two cats and a husband, and it's just madness. Um, and I have an amazing team of therapists. Um, and I love everything sensory, everything. Yeah, I think we can't, as Nikki was saying, we are all sensory beings, and that is all of us. Um, I think, um, yeah, sensory processing needs to have a much, much bigger part in our education system. Um, so I kind of go off piece a little bit. A little bit about me as well. I was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 42. My medications only take me up to a certain part of the day, so <laughs> I will try and uh, speak slowly. Okay, so before we start, I know you've just had lunch, so I'm going to ask you if you're able to and if you want to, I would like you to please try standing up. For a second. Okay, if you're safe and if you feel okay to do so, I would like you to stand on your strong leg, your dominant leg. Just lift the other one up, see how long you can go for. Okay, good, and I can see who's holding their legs down. Okay, put your leg down, relax. Now I'd like you to stand on your other leg and close your eyes if you can. If you feel yourself falling, stop yourself, okay? Open your eyes, <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay. So, next thing I want you to do is I want you to copy me, okay? Okay. And this is one I like to do with the kids, <laughs> okay. Okay, next one we're going to do very quickly is I want you to um, copy my clapping pattern, okay? Okay, 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 and someone's enjoying the, the clapping over there, okay, and now we're going to do, oh, you're still up there, <laughs> okay, no, that's fine, that's fine, so have a seat. Um, and what you've just demonstrated is all of those skills that Nikki was talking about earlier, about your, your gross motor skills, your fine motor skills, but also um, the ability to follow instructions, the ability to copy. And so you were amazing at saying, actually, I wasn't sure whether I have to follow along or whether I have to follow along afterwards. Um, and yeah, so when we think about sensory processing, it's really thinking about... Um, everything that we are. So we know that, do you know that we have eight senses, yeah? If you nodded, I'm gonna pick on you. Just start shouting them out. Start with the easy ones. Go on, name the senses. Nikki, you have to keep quiet. And you, Asper, you have to keep quiet as well. <laughs> Go on, sight, yeah, good. Touch, taste, smell, yeah. Balance, excellent, brownie point. Oh, double brownie point. <laughs> Anything else? Hearing, yeah. You can't answer again. You've got two double points ready. Yeah. Proprioception, correct. Okay, so we're going to go through those, but it's kind of you have eight senses, and we tend to forget about the key players because we can't see them. Things just happen without us realizing what we're doing. Okay. Um, and... And so really we need to, when we are our sensory processing, it's basically what allows us to filter out noises and to pay attention to what's important and what's not important. So just think about things like, um, like sitting in a classroom or sitting right here right now. You are paying attention to me. Some of you might be a little bit sleepy after lunch and so you might be jiggling your leg to try and stay alert or to stay regulated. If we suddenly had um, a fire alarm, we would kind of look, and because we know that there are no fire alarms due to be tested, we'll leave. 
okay? So it's paying attention and shifting our focus as, um, as we need to do that. And um, I'm gonna show you just a little video. And this really is just, I think it's just the importance of um, this oh. little dude. <laughs> Try again. So if you look at his hands, using bubbles is such an important skill. Being able to make that grip, being able to put, to hold with the other hand, putting that little lid thing into the box, the, um, the bottle. Oh, and then man. think about oh, your man. face, keep your going, mouth, those no, 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 oral no. skills. Um, oh, oh man. man. I just wanted to say, oh man. Um. <gasps> ah. Try again. Nice and slow, nice ah, and bit. slow. Try again, nice and slow. Yeah, dip, dip, dip. So it's just, just bearing in mind that actually, Everything you do oh, starts with the sensory. Ah. So we have the fine okay. motor skills. Okay, let's get it in there. You know, he's standing up while she's nice and stable. Ah. Um, Try again. <laughs> Try again. You know, think about some more. Get some more. That's in your lips. Um, it's in the back. Ah. <laughs> Did you? You know, and it's that is what. I think OT is about is we are trying to get kids to achieve what they can achieve and to be happy, I think, is, is just phenomenally important and to be comfortable, but to reach your goals and reach, reach your, you know, your targets, your milestones. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. I'm not playing that oh. again. Um, so, you know, when you have kids who are struggling with their sensory processing, you can see a range of, of, um, of difficulties or behaviors, okay? So you might see the kids who, so we talk about kids who under respond and who over respond. So I'm basically putting like a huge number of slides into one little talk. So just, yeah, okay, we can, I can send you more information. So you might have in a classroom, so I go into a lot of classes, a lot of schools, we both do, um, and you'll see the kids I kind of call them two types of kids. We have the meerkats, and then we have the ones who are just really sluggish. So your meerkats are the ones who are going to attend to every single thing. So, oh, that lady's jiggling her leg. Why is she jiggling her leg? I'm gonna look over there. And, oh, someone's taking something out of their bag. What's gonna be in their bag? Oh, the pencil's falling over there. Hey, hey, your pencil's falling. So every little thing, and they're gonna be distractible, okay? Because they can't screen all of that out. Then you're gonna have the kids who are also, um, are going to be the ones who the teacher will say, right, everyone, they do this whole thing, one, two, three, eyes on me, and everyone's looking, and then there's one who's still kind of over there, and the teacher will say, right, line up, everyone, get your coats, and there's always one who's still kind of sitting on the floor, and, you know, just taking that much longer to process that information, and then they'll kind of go, oh, everyone's lined up. Okay, yeah, maybe I should line up, and then they'll, slowly get up and they'll go and line up and then they won't have their coat because they've missed that bit of the information as well, okay? Um, what we say is that we can um, over or under respond to a variety of, of senses and you can also do both. You can fluctuate in a certain day and your sensory processing is really closely linked to your levels of alertness, your arousal levels linked to that autonomic nervous system, that fight or flight. Um, so I, I give an example of when my kids were younger, um, we had um, nannies and so I'd come home. If I'd had a really good day, and by good day I mean I've, I've had loads of sessions where I've been playing, so I've had all my balance needs fulfilled, my proprioception, traffic was fine, I've eaten enough, I get home and the kids are screaming as in, one is trying to kill the other. The dogs are going mad because I'm home. Um, and, you know, I'm fine. I can cope with that. It's, it's okay. If that exact same scenario, but I've come home, I'm late, I've had a really perhaps difficult emotional session just before that. Um, I was stuck in horrific traffic. I'm hungry. I... You know, I then come home and it's kind of like, I can't cope. 
this is just too much. And we all have that every day. You go through these moments where you are really quite well regulated. And in that band of being well regulated, that's your optimal engagement. That's where you can really function and you can, and you can thrive. But it's not just limited to this child with this specific difficulty. We all go through it every single day and we all do things. I mean, I've been watching you guys. You all do different things to stay regulated and to stay alert and focused. Um, and you know, that's what we see in our kids. Some kids might tap constantly. I hum um, a lot and I sing a lot and I share a study with my 19-year-old um, my who is very sensory, like he can't handle noise and things and he's constantly saying, oh my God, shut up, you hum so much. And I'm like, oh, am I, you know? Or I'm really loud, like I like, I like singing and I have songs for everything. So I sing to the dogs when I get home and you know, I sing all the time, I sing in all my sessions. Um, but I also know that some kids need it to be a bit quieter. And those ones I, I do, I'm able to go quieter and to be slower because that's what you need to do, right? And that's what you guys do. I think that what parents do so brilliantly is when we get to that assessment stage that Nikki was talking about, we'll, I often get a referral and parents will say they have huge sensory issues. And then I look at the forms and it's like, there's nothing on there. But you guys are so amazing at adapting you adapt and you make these accommodations for your kids without realizing. And actually at home, they are their truest selves. They are relaxed, they are comfortable, because you are giving them exactly what they need um, without even realizing it. Yeah, so I hope that that makes sense, that you just, you are you're all amazing OTs, aren't they? They just like do things just, um, just brilliantly. Um, yeah, when we, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, so I'm just going to go back one there. Um, just thinking about quite often with, um, children with ACC will have a lot of difficulties with touch, food textures, temperature hypersensitivity, um, and they might have a high pain tolerance slow processing speed, um, and, and that's just also important to, to bear in mind. Okay, so when we think about touch, um, you have different pathways for touch. So I, um, I have a podcast that about five people listen to, and I still talk as though hundreds of people are listening to it, but I um, talk about, sometimes when I have a guest, I'll say to them, which sense would you rather lose, your sight or your hearing? So put your hands up if you'd rather use, lose your sight. Okay. So the rest of you, I'm going to guess, would rather lose your hearing. Yeah? Okay. Put your hand up if you'd rather lose your... Which sight would you rather lose, your hearing or your touch? So if you'd rather lose your hearing, put your hand up. Okay. Excellent. Um, I think the tactile system is the most amazing system ever. Um, I think without touch, we are pretty much nothing. You won't be able to sit, you won't be able to feel anything that you're doing right now. Um, and I think touch is so important for bonding, for that emotional side. Um, if you will indulge me and just roll up your sleeve if you can. Um, if you can't, that's also fine. But I just want you to expose this little bit of skin over there. Okay, and then I want you to, if you are okay doing this, just gently run your nails up and down that little part of your skin there. Oh, don't do it for him. You never just touch someone lightly. That's like the worst thing to do. Are you sure he likes? Well, actually, I, I'm not gonna ask. Um, so, so some people, apparently like that and are very happy to just sit there and tickle themselves. My son used to call it ticky backy and I used to like scratch his back for hours to get him to sleep because um, melatonin didn't work for him. So that was another story. But um, I saw someone over there was doing that. You were rubbing it out literally because it just feels so awful, right? And I always say you've got two kind of, in a very simple way, pathways for touch. You've got your pathway that carries your light touch, and I say that goes from, so I live near the M25, so that would go 
from Junction 8 at Rygate, Junction 8 here, and instead of going straight to Junction 9, it'll go 765 all the way around, whereas your other tract carries that deep pressure and it will go straight there. So when you apply that deep pressure, you are overriding it. So when um, my kids were little and they had stubbed their toe, I would say, let me kiss it better. And that actually means you are applying that pressure, that deep pressure, and so it's overriding the light touch. So it's, you know, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and so you have these, these tactile tracts, but they allow you to do things like do the little clasp on your necklace without looking, okay? You don't even think about it. You just do that without looking. They allow you to tie your shoelaces without looking at what you're doing and still talking to your friend, okay? Um, and it's all of those skills, like you saw Dexter, opening that little bottle without having to look at it, um, reaching into your handbag and feeling for the inhaler versus the keys. So you're using your tactile sense to be able to do that. Now, if you can't do that, you are spending so much of your time looking at what's going on, okay? Um, and so that's where that, that sense of touch is just so important, but also it extends to your mouth. So if we think about kids with textures or when they wean, they struggle when you have lumpy food because actually there's, now there's a pea and then there's a bit of broccoli, but there's also a sauce and I just, actually don't know what to do with that. So it's that fine perception as well. Um, one of the biggest reasons we have referrals for OT is for kids who are tactile defensive, because actually any touch on them um, just feels horrible. It just sends them into this fight or flight. And so that's why when you were stroking the gentleman next to you, um, we always, always say is, <laughs> her husband, sorry. We always, always say is, Deep pressure. Deep pressure is if you forget anything else today, it's going to be, um, you have to remember deep pressure and proprioception. I'll come on to that later. Okay, but deep pressure. If you think of going to meet someone and you shake their hand and they give you kind of a, a horrible handshake, as opposed to a nice firm handshake, right? If you think about a hug, if someone comes to give you a hug and they aren't sure about it, you kind of go, oh, I'm not sure about this. But just think about those people who are like, proper big huggers. Like I've got a, a couple of friends who they'll hug you and then they'll hug you and I just kind of go, oh, you know, because you just like, you know that you are being hugged, you have that pressure. Um, and so it's just, yeah, just touch is just super important. Next we come on to proprioception. So proprioception is knowing where your body is in space, okay? So you guys earlier, you could copy me. If you knew what I was doing, you could stand on one leg, okay? You're, proprioceptors are located in, I'll hurry up, are located in all your joints. And every time you move, you are activating your proprioceptors. So when you stamp your feet, when you clap your hands, okay, every time you move, you are activating your proprioceptors. And proprioception is phenomenally, phenomenally, hugely calming, organizing, regulating. And that's when we talk about heavy work. So when we talk about sensory regulation plans, when we come onto EHCPs, we talk about heavy work, pushing, pulling, activating that. So um, Nikki does lots of exercise <laughs> and she always like, she goes, you know, her, when she's done all that exercise, she goes, oh, she feels great afterwards, yeah? So if you think about yourself as well, if you, when you've done exercise, when you've danced, when you've even just gone for a walk, that really is calming, organizing, regulating, just standing up as well. Um, and then we're gonna talk about our vestibular sense, just briefly. So your vestibular apparatus is located in your inner ear. Um, I'm trying to, to condense this. Um, and it's all about movement. It's all about speed. It's about change of direction. If you can remember when you, um, your baby was younger, you used to stand and rock the baby and then someone would take the baby away from you and you'd still be rocking, yeah? Um, if you um, are on a train, my husband has this ability to just fall asleep on a train immediately. 
Um, but it's also knowing that sense of your vestibular system is really closely linked to your eyes. So when you're on a train, you're sitting, you know your train's not moving, the train next to you is moving, and you kind of have that feeling. So it's that, um, that position, knowing where you are in space, knowing if you are upright. Um, your vestibular um, system is also really closely linked to your auditory system, so knowing where the sounds are coming from. So that <laughs> auditory localization. Um, and something a lot of people will always say is, when I was younger, I used to love roller coasters and I could go on them forever. But now that I'm older, I really, really struggle. And that's because aging really affects our vestibular system. And um, yeah, so you can make sure that doesn't happen by just constantly going on roller coasters and just getting that feedback if you'd like. Um, so as OTs, we go through a range of techniques to um, address all the different challenges that we can have. We will do a lot of it is training and educating to parents and teachers um, and, and looking at that environment and adapting that environment, but also listening to the child um, and looking at what they um, want to do. Okay, there is a little picture of our clinic which has changed since then. Um, so yeah, what you can do is following those sensory regulation plans. A sensory regulation plan used to be called a sensory diet, or it's incorrectly called a sensory diet. Um, a lot of, so we are, are obviously an um, independent private practice. A lot of sensory diets, if you get a sensory diet from your OT and it is five pages long, and it has 7,900 activities on there. That is not an individualized, specified sensory regulation plan. Um, okay, it's not. We, the idea of a sensory regulation plan is that it is individualized. It is specific and the activities on there are going to be activities that that child needs and responds well to, okay. Um, working in schools, we try and get those plans to be one page back to front because TAs don't have the time to look at lots and lots of, um, of activities. Um, yeah, so we have that and I'm going to, um, obviously collaborating with the team is super important. I'm going to end this little part of our presentation with just showing you a video of our clinic and what OT is, and that will give me a chance to have a drink, and then Nikki will answer all your questions. Um, so hopefully this will work. Thank you. 
is us and OT in a nutshell. Um, any questions? You can ask Nikki. Uh, cool. Any questions? Lovely. Thank you so much. This is how much fun Jimmy has every single time. He loves it. Um, that was a great talk. Well done. Any questions from anybody? Yes. Firstly, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I want to caveat it by saying I appreciate everything you do, but obviously it's a huge privilege being able to afford to pay for even just the assessment for private occupational therapy, even though we know it's kind of vital given the frequency of NHS. Um, earlier I asked, I'm not sure if you were in the room, that we're having problems just even unlocking NHS occupational therapy because they say my daughter doesn't need any. And it would be really great to hear from you guys as occupational therapists, what can we do to help challenge that and unlock it from the NHS and then obviously um, yeah that and any kind of resources that you would recommend that weren't paying for you know a 700 yeah. 800 pound assessment and the ongoing fees of OT would yeah. would be great yeah no um absolutely I think the um the system is very broken um like it's appallingly broken um and it is incredibly hard if you don't have the resources. Um, the NHS, the systems are stretched um, and they will say your child doesn't need OT. Um, I would, my advice would be to keep on going back to them, but to always make it about function and to always make it about independence. So yes, they are apparently well behaved in class, but they can't get themselves dressed in the morning. So bringing it back to all of those functional, occupational participation skills, um, you know, it's not about, well certainly for me, I hate handwriting. It's not about handwriting. It's about that child being able to sit in a class and pay attention and ask a question, answer a question. Sorry, that's, oh. I'll just leave that there. Oh, I won't leave that there. Um, and I think it's, um, yeah, bringing it back to function is super, super important and saying they're sleep. They're not sleeping without all of these steps that you have to do. Um, and <sighs> exaggerated, think about your child on the worst possible day. Okay, because a lot of parents, I mean, I, if I think of myself and my parenting journey, you kind of go, but it's not that bad, you know, and then you're just delaying getting that support. Um, yeah, so I would say think about them in their, on their worst day and bringing it back to that function, bringing it back to that independence, those OT skills, that participation skills. Can they set up, can they enjoy family meal times can they um transition can you know all of those things and it's just thinking about that day when they are at their worst um everywhere is just it's it's horrific um and yeah um we do a lot of work in schools um and and that's one way that we feel we can kind of go in is just to provide that training for staff and for parents um, and just, you know, it's the simple things that you can do. Um, yeah. Um, it, it's so hard. It's, yeah, if this wasn't recorded, I'd use my proper language. But um, it's, um, it, it's really, really hard. And there are days when I know, I mean, we just kind of go, what's the point? You know, what's the point of doing this? But um, yeah. Um, sorry, that's not the right. That's. 
adopting because she's only 15 months. So I think we're at that stage where they can quite easily dismiss things if gross motor and fine motor are age dependent, you know, until yeah, but, something shows. So I think um, but it's, it's fine. About, we're going through a private assessment. Yeah, but, but, but it's all about early intervention as well. Exactly. You exactly. Know, and that's where I have, we have the one year olds come and we have the 12 month olds come. And, um, and again, it is, it is private, but it's all about that early intervention. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, you have to go through that. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I think I just wanted to make a comment about that as well. My my son is 11 now, and I feel like, um, I'm probably going to get a bit emotional about it, I feel like we've missed opportunities all the way along because we, it's that watch and wait, and we were told that right from the beginning. And... Um, we, we kind of looked at him and we looked at him against other children. We thought, well, at that age, it probably isn't that much of a problem. You know, so we didn't push and we didn't push. And now got to this point, actually, he's really struggling. You know, he's 11 and the occupational therapist, the NHS occupational therapist, to be honest, it just seems to be their job to discharge them. And um, I feel like we've missed so many opportunities. So I would totally say just push and push and push. If you feel like they need it, just keep pushing because I feel like we've missed so many opportunities. Um, and your story is not, you're not the only ones. I mean, it's, um, it's heartbreaking. It, it really, really is. You know, we get some kids and I'm, I'm working with a little girl now and um, they've said, oh, let's give her two years. And, and when she hits puberty, things will go really badly and she'll fall apart and then we'll see her. And it's like, how can you even say something like that about a child who's meant to be our future, right? Who's meant to be, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Any yeah. Th thank you for those oh, comments. Oh, it's it's Asma here. Um, I think what I'm hearing from you parents, from all of us here, and this is something that I will take on board in terms of how can we help with, you know, what's the next thing that we as a charity can do, is something that is on the agenda, but maybe we can push a little more for that to happen perhaps in 2024, I would love to see a conference where it's for teachers. Um, obviously, parents will come, but it's for teachers where I want you guys to come. I would love Karima to come, that we're doing the dyscalculia assessments together. I want the teachers to learn about these things because, you, you know, maybe I'm generalizing a little bit, but also if you ask teachers when was the last time you've been to a workshop like this? When was the last time you've been to a neurodiversity course? When was the last time you've read anything? It doesn't have to be about ACC. It just needs to be about imagination and creativity around neurodiversity and what can you do to help the children you're with? The answer will be actually quite poor. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, this is sort of the next bit that I wanna do with our charity, if we can, is to reach out to the teachers and see where, what level they're at in terms of familiarity with this. It's not gonna sort the problem out, but it's just the way of trying to help you guys, mm -hmm. help, help the members and help the children. Because if we have teachers that we understand things a little bit more, they're a little bit more open-minded, um, and they have a better idea, on, on this, on sensory integration and, and all of this, how a child processes information, um, how the writing comes about, it doesn't just, doesn't just develop from one day to the next. If they have a better understanding, they can perhaps, perhaps support that child a little bit better. So it is, it is something that I would like to see Corbel do in the next 12 months in terms of a specifically a parents, uh, sorry, a teacher's workshop. Yeah. Cool. I'm not sure if I see something controversial here, but sometimes I get parents who come in and say they will, they've been told to wait and watch but, and they're saying that if they themselves can provide certain interventions at home, they said if they do that, then the child will not show his real raw, rawness of where his gaps are. And I think you get an assessment 
the assessment. Anyway, there may be, probably there may be a delay, and you know. But in the meantime, whilst you wait and watch, those connections in the pathways are not being made, and we are losing time. In the early development stages, time is at a premium. So when the assessment comes in, what a bonus it will be if your child has done better. Then you've got another milestone to reach. And so the journey continues. So don't stop. Wait and watch is not something that we want to do. We want to come up with our own pathways. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Excellent. Right. Um, right, I, um, it's me again, um, so Asfa asked me to talk about EHCPs and tribunals and, oh, yeah, um, I, so I don't know if you know, but I um, act as an expert witness for parents at tribunals. Um, I hope that none of you ever have to go to a tribunal because it is one of the, the hardest things to go through, not just financially, because that's like, I mean, it is a ginormous cost, but emotionally, it takes a huge toll on parents. Um, physically, it's hard. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I, yeah. I really hope that you never have to go to a tribunal. Um, and that's why we try and do our assessments in such detail so that we can stop that from happening. Um, I work with a number of um, solicitors and advocates um, and also parents who do it themselves um, to go through that process um, for getting an EHCP. How many of your kids have an EHCP? Can you put your hands up. Okay. Okay. Um, the ones who's, who've put your hands up, how many of you have an excellent, rigorous, watertight EHCP? Have you been to tribunal? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So we have. Excellent. So you can have an EHCP and parents will, you know, parents don't know and then they get an EHCP and it's absolutely rubbish. Um, so yeah, make sure that your EHCP is, is amazing. Um, I've got some slides, but I'm also just going to talk. This is from the Gov, um, the Gov.uk website is that it is for people up to 25 who need more support, okay? Um, there is a video, I will send it out, it just goes through everything, but I think it's more, probably there's some more questions and it's more just about chatting about the process if you'd like. Would you, li would you like me to play the video? Can I play the video? Okay, I'll play the video. Let me just check if I'm still connected. I am still connected. Um, what is an education, health and social care plan and who is it for? In 2014, the Children and Families Act became law and introduced a new system of support which is relevant to parents and carers of children and young people aged 0 to 25 who have special educational needs or disabilities. This means that there is a requirement to produce education, health and care plans, or EHCPs, using person-centred approaches. EHCPs replace statements of special educational needs and what were called learning difficulty assessments. Two of the key messages featuring in the Children and Families Act are that preparation for adulthood starts in early years, just as it does for all other children, and all education providers are required to establish and maintain a culture of high expectations so all children and young people can achieve well. This means that goals set should be challenging not just for the children and young people, but for the education service providers too. 
This requires plans to have a much wider scope than a statement, which generally only address the needs of an educational nature. The plan should, wherever possible, stretch across four themes. Learning and future employment, home and independence, friends, relationships and community, and health and well-being. Local authorities must issue a plan for a child or young person whose needs cannot be met from the expected budget in mainstream schools or settings, and for those who attend special schools or specialist colleges. An EHCP has 17 sections labelled A to K. Each section has a different purpose and it is a legally binding document, meaning that certain things in it must happen. The contents of the EHCP are intended to be creative and a shared challenge for all those involved in order to achieve the best possible results and outcomes for the child or young person. In developing a plan, Local authorities have a duty to take into account Section 19 principles and must have regard to the views, wishes and feelings of the child, young person or parent, the importance of their full participation in decisions, the importance of their being provided with the necessary information and support to participate, and the need to support the child or young person to achieve the best possible educational and other outcomes, preparing them effectively for adulthood. How can you find out more or access local services and support? You can find out more about the SEND reforms and the education, health and care planning process by visiting the local offer page on your local authority website. Here, you'll be able to find impartial information, advice and support and learn about all the services that are available to you. Parents who require additional support are referred to their local information, advice and support service. Further information, including a useful resource on writing good quality EHC plans, can be found at councilfordisabledchildren.org.uk. Oh, what is? There you go. Um, so, yeah, EHCPs. If you go to your local authority's website, and I have looked at a number of them, the information that you see on there regarding EHCPs is a little bit skewed towards what they can provide sometimes. One of the most important things that I hear in a tribunal is that it's not about what they can provide, but about what your child needs. Yeah, I'm going to just mute that because I think I've got WhatsApp coming to my thing. Um, and I'll often have... Um, the opposing with the local authority OT and they'll say yeah but this is all we we can provide and that's when the parents um, representatives kind of just go excellent because the law is it's not about what they can provide but what that child needs yeah um, you have um, this is in your slide as well but you basically have it takes a long time a long, long, long time to get a really, really good EHCP that's written that you're happy with. So week zero to six, so this was taken from one of the um, local authorities that I don't rate very highly, um, but it is accurate. So you make that application, you can do it yourself. I'd always say try and get the school on side. Um, so you make the application together. Um, and you then say, right, I would like you to assess. Local authority will look at your paperwork and they'll either come back and they'll say, no, we're not going to assess. Or they'll come back and they'll say, yes, we will assess. Generally, um, the kids we work with, <laughs> they come back and they say, no, we're not going to assess. Your child is fine. They don't meet the threshold. That's then when parents go and they appeal. Um, and you then get this request for advice. So that's when parents go and they get their own private reports. Quite often parents are told that private reports are not accepted and that they won't look at them. What has been happening a lot or what I'm, I see a lot is that the judges or the panels or the, um, the um, tribunals will say, actually, we have a report here. It's a report just because you haven't been able to get the assessment done. 
that is not the child's fault. You have an assessment here. So quite often your local authority will say, we will not accept a private report. Um, we do a lot of work for the local authorities and for schools where they commission us to write the EHCPs and we write them and they send them off and the local authorities just don't add the information because they don't like what we've written and that we've not put in enough. If you as a parent don't know that it's been left out, then you can get a report that, or a, um, a plan that doesn't have all the necessary information in it, yeah? Um, and that happens a lot as well. Some of the LAs are, uh, yeah, not always very forthcoming and um, I'm being recorded. Um, yeah, so I would say just check, check everything. Um, stay, you'll have a caseworker, you'll have a key worker, um, a caseworker. Quite often, parents will say, I've never spoken to my case officer or my case officer left six months ago and no one told me. So just stay, it's, it's like having another job going through the EHCP process because you have to be on top of it all the time. And that's, you know, that's horrific because it's, you have to have all the documents. Every single time that you speak to the local authority, get it in writing. Yeah, don't just go with phone calls. Um, and I know I'm sounding very like I'm, you know, jaded, but I've, I've seen so many things that could just be avoided. And just get everything in writing and just be like a dog with a bone and don't stop, you know, just go on and on and on. Um, and that's why it can take so long because parents will say, actually, that's not reflective of my child. That's not their needs. You know, their needs are not just that. Um, so many times I see EHCPs and in the sensory um, and physical section, it says, um, likes movement, um, can't kick a ball. And you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's great. You know, because that is just not reflective. Um, so, yeah, I would say just when you get that draft plan, go through it, send it back, go through it, send it back until you are absolutely happy with it. Yeah. Um, there are advocates that can help. There are, um, yeah, but I would say just really look at that side of things. So when we think about our EHCPs, you know how they said that there were all those sections where us as OTs will really have input, will be in that section B, which is your special educational needs, section E, which is the outcomes, and section F, which is special education provision. Those are the three sections that are often very highly um, appealed and disputed in um, assessments, along with quite often section I, um, yeah, it's like in my head already, B, F and I. So I is the school that is being chosen. Um, and that's where we would then get involved and look at those, at those sections. So, you know, section A is going to be your aspirations for your child, your views. Um, quite often, this part can't be appealed because it's the family's views, yeah. Um, sometimes they try. Um, section B is going to be your child's strengths and needs. So it's strengths and needs. It is very, very disheartening to get a report. Um, I mean, my, my son never got any HCP. I mean, he didn't yeah, need one, but it's very disheartening to read a professional report and you just see everything they can't do. And actually it's like, oh, great, you know because actually all our kids have so many strengths and we need to list those. Um, believe it or not, sometimes the local authority will challenge strengths. Um, and I've had a judge go, why are we arguing over what's the strength? This child is doing something amazing here. But yeah, it happens. Um, section C is going to be the health needs, which are going to relate to their SEN. Same with section D, which is the social care needs. Um, and yeah, section E is going to be the outcomes. And 
that is what is described in B, C, and D. So we try and say that for every need, there should be an outcome. Um, outcomes need to be smart, you know, but smart is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. And they have to be personal rather than just generic. We have actually, we write um, outcomes for at the end of the key stage or that key phase, and we then do 12 month outcomes. We've actually sadly, well, we have as a practice, we've taken out the 12 month outcomes because sometimes it takes so long that those outcomes are no longer relevant. Yeah. And so we just focus on those, those key outcomes. And again, it's making sure that they are related to function, to independence, to participation and engagement. Um, yeah. Um, section F is going to be the provision. What that child needs so that their special education needs can be met. Um, this is usually the longest part of the, um, of the EHCP and one that is most contested um, in those working documents that you get. Um, section G is going to be any healthcare provision that they might need. Um, H is going to be social care, if there's a social care aspect of it. Um, and then I is going to be the school, the school that um, perhaps the local authority are offering versus the school that the parents want their child to go to, but also that the professionals have decided actually, specifically the um, educational psychologist have said actually this will be the best fit. Um, section J is your personal budgets. So if you have an EHCP, you can hold the budget for your child and you can make those payments directly, which therapists love because local authorities take a very long time to pay and can be, can hold things up. Um, yeah. When we think about the four main sections of an EHCP, you have cognition and learning, communication, social, emotional and health, and your sensory and physical. So cognition and learning is generally where your educational psychologists and your teachers are going to input into. Communication is generally the speech therapist. Um, SEMH is going to be your educational psychologist, um, your clinical psychologist and the OT. And then your sensory and physical is going to be the OT or the physio. When we write EHCP reports, we just limit it to sensory and physical. We used to add things into cognition, and into all areas, because OT, you can go into all areas, but you then have judges saying, oh, but you're only supposed to do sensory and physical. So now we just relate every single sensory and physical difficulty and the impact it has on cognition and learning and communication and SEMH, yeah. Um, we think about section B, it's going to be your strengths. Section B, your needs, your outcomes, and the provision. So I, Xavier is my son, my eldest son. So if we think about some strengths, Xavier has good handwriting speed. He always had great handwriting. Some of Xavier's needs. Um, so you're not going to write on there. If you get an EHCP and it says needs, struggles with sensory processing, and that's all they've put in there, that's not good enough. You need to make sure that every single area is specified. So when I think about tactile, you will specify the tactile reactivity. So Xavier is, well, he was, very reactive to, clo um, to clothes and different textures. Um, he, let's say he also had difficulties with tactile discrimination, okay? Every single bit needs to be lined up and you need to then say what that difficulty is impacting. So, Xavier has difficulties processing tactile inputs. He's reactive to incidental touch, so just being touched on the playground and textures and therefore struggles getting changed for PE because there are other kids, he's got to take off his uniform, which he already hates because it's a shirt with a tie. Um, and so he's going to take longer. He's going to have meltdowns. He's going to have days when it's time um, or when they are, it's PE or games, and he's going to start refusing to go into school on those days 
because of the, the emotional reaction he has to that task. Okay, so you can see how you can then bring it back to your participation, your SEMH, that communication side. Um, lining up, he's going to not want to line up. He's not going to want to do art activities, engaging in messy play. Um, Xavier has poor postural control. So when Nikki was talking about the gross motor skills, being able to sit up, just being able to sit upright and hold yourself up. There are very few of you here who are sitting very upright um, because it's hard, right? It's hard to sit for ages. Now, if you have poor core, you are already at a disadvantage. So you're sitting like this and then they ask you to write and to pay attention and to sit still. But actually, if I have poor postural control, I'm gonna jiggle because I'm gonna need that feedback. And then teachers say, sit still. And actually, when I go into schools and do training and teachers go, they just won't sit still. And I go, okay, you try and sit still for 45 minutes. And then you've got kids who are very literal, who are scared, like my son was, of moving. So he just sat still because he was told to sit still. But actually that's incredibly hard. The teachers have the advantage of being able to walk up and down and they can sit and they can do all of that and get their needs fulfilled but actually sitting upright for a long period of time is incredibly hard. Um, so then you have a child who, which causes him to tire and fatigue, he has poor endurance and stamina. That means that after a double lesson of English, he's also dyslexic, he would be incredibly exhausted, but he would be incredibly emotional. So every little thing would then set him off. So then you're going back to that SEMH side. He's autistic, so then you go back to that communication side. He can't say what he is feeling, yeah? So you have to really tease out every little section. And I've just put two little bits there, but you can do it for auditory, for every little thing. And it looks like it's overkill, but it's not, because you are just accurately describing everything that is affecting your child's participation and engagement, yeah? Um, then we come to the outcomes, and again, you want to have three or four outcomes, five outcomes, which is going to say that at the end of this key stage, at the end of senior school, you want a child who is ready to go on to adulthood. You want a child who is able to have a um, sensory processing that will allow him to take a school bus. So he's not going to be affected by people touching him. He's going to know where sounds are coming from. He's going to be able to have the core strength to go up to the top of the bus. So that's the type of thing you need to be looking at, is making it just super, super um, functional, okay? And, and detailing it like that. Um, yeah, and then if, you, if he's gonna have support, say with minimal verbal prompting, or with one-to-one -one support, or with visual support. So make it very, very clear, because if it's very clear, it will be very easy to know whether that outcome has been met or not, okay? Your EHCP is reviewed every year. Um, and then you've got provision. Provision provided by the setting, so they have to provide a low arousal environment. They have to provide flexible seating so that he can move, and they have to provide, um, they have to implement his sensor sensory regulation plan so that he can stand up and move around the class so that they do have standing desks and this helps every single child in the class so when we go in we try and get the local pta funds to buy more than one piece of equipment because all the other kids will benefit from it um, and your child won't feel single that um, and then what the ot needs to provide and again here, make sure that your OT has absolutely quantified it. So they will devise a regulation plan. When? At the start of the school year. They're then going to train the teaching staff in how to implement that regulation plan. It's gonna take two hours at the start of the year. Um, the OT is going to review that plan with the teaching staff and the child. And it's gonna be every term, it's gonna take an hour a term, okay? He requires this amount of one-to-one -one sessions, and then again specify this is the amount of time for actual sessions, but also there's a lot of admin that goes on behind it, and you need to quantify that. So we can often, we'll write an EHCP, and it will end up with being 32 hours of direct work, and then another 15 hours of that indirect work 
of doing the reviewing, of doing the liaising, of doing the teaching and training and writing that annual review report, attending the annual reviews. Um, yeah, common issues, as I've said previously, um, EHCPs come in late, local authorities don't do it on time, they aren't specific enough, um, local authorities try to use your child's one-to-one -one provision and get the TA to work with four other kids. And that's kind of like, that's just, what are you doing, right? Um, local authorities say, well, they've had a session in a pair and you go, actually, his EHCP, which is a legal document, states one-to-one -one sessions, yeah? If we feel that, you know, after the, the um, annual review, they can move on to paired sessions, yeah, we'll write it in, okay? Um, something we find a lot is that parents get, um, they don't want EHCPs to change because they have fought so hard to get that EHCP, yeah? And you are gonna fight again at the next phase transfer. You're gonna fight again when they go to college. You're gonna fight again when they're 19 and they have to go to that next provision. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's rubbish, but yeah. Um, so I thought we'd end on something positive. And I'm going to give you, I'm just gonna talk you through a little case study. This is a girl, we'll call her Cassie. Um, she, I first met her at one of our local schools when she was nine. She's currently 19 and a half, almost 20. Um, so she has ASD, ADHD, overreactivity to touch and sound. And her goals were very different to her parents' goals. Um, and I have made many parenting mistakes. And so now I'm all about the child. Um, and she was desperate to work with animals, but she's also really scared of them. And when I say really scared of them, she is petrified of animals. Um, and so we started using my therapy dog, Buster. Buster is anxious himself. And for some reason, he just works beautifully with kids who have anxiety. Um, and we slowly introduced it. So we slowly introduced her just so that first picture, she's on a swing and he's sitting on her lap. So she was worried about movement, he was there. And gradually what we did was we got her to work with him. So every time he barked, she was full on fight or flight. And it took a long time, but we got to a stage where she would take him to the local park on her own. We had one day where we were at the local park and these two dogs had never seen them before. And she was able to hold the treats for them and say sit in a commanding voice and they sat. And, you know, so it's, it's looking at actually, she loves animals. She could one day work with animals. She could be a dog groomer. So it's thinking about that um, activities like that. She was desperate to dress him up. She didn't like going shopping in big spaces. So we went to pets at home at Christmas time. Um, and she was more stable sitting down, so she sat down in the middle of the floor. He tried on loads of outfits. He loves it because he get lots of treats. Um, her mum was somewhere behind me in tears. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's kind of what you can achieve. Um, we have a local dog groomers next to us. And I spoke to the guy. Um, and they said, hey, yeah, she can come in. So then she went in when they only had two dogs. I don't know if you've ever been into a dog groomer's. It is incredibly loud. They have those dryers going, and sometimes you have dogs who are really crying. Um, and those were some of her aims. She wanted to be able to do that, and we then got to that. In terms of therapy, she wanted to work on her flexibility. So we do some aerial yoga. She liked yoga. She likes being upside down. We incorporated that as well. She then moved to college. She moved to a, the local college where she was studying animal handling. She's doing it very, very, very slowly. I got a phone call to say, can we move sessions to the college because she's dropping the animals? And she was literally like picking them up and then freaking out and dropping the animals. Um, and again, there it was a case of adapting the environment. 
um, the little black guinea pig is called Sher. She has loads of long hair. Um, and saying, actually, why didn't you try wearing gloves? Because she was worried that she was going to get bitten. And, you know, our narrative was animals do bite because they do. Um, but it's working with that. Ear defenders, she went from having her ear defenders, you can see in the middle picture, it used to be on her ears to just on her head, around her neck, in her pocket. She no longer um, has, has her ear defenders. Um, she would often surprise me and not tell me, like that second picture, that we were handling snakes. So I would get to college and they'd be like, oh, we're going to do snakes today. And then I had to, you know, but that was a teaching moment. She had done it. She then taught me how to hold the snake. So it's all of those little steps that your EHCP, because it's so well written, will say that actually, and at the annual review, you update it. You say, actually, I'm going to see a fortnightly, but it's going to be for an hour and a half each time. Or I'm going to see her and you, you say, and so often I won't say exactly that it has to be in a clinic or it has to be at school because kids aren't restricted, kids and young people aren't restricted to those areas. So we've been on buses, we've been, she now takes the train to and from college on her own every day. Um, you know, and it's just about working it up. But if you don't have any HCP that's gonna give you that support, because what it comes down to is money, right? That support is money. Um, she is just doing phenomenally well now. Um, and I have another young person, pretty much the same age, who doesn't have such a watertight EHCP and she is, you can see the difference, um, which is just sad. So, you know, um, yeah. So EHCPs in a nutshell. Any questions? Excellent. Urgh! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That, oh, oh um, just because your child's got ACC, does that entitle them to an EHCP? Are they able to do everything for themselves? Well, she's one and a half, so at the minute, no. Yeah, and, and if you think about the trajectory, looking at the research, mm. um, it is likely that your child is going to need additional support. Mm -hmm. And they talk about this nominal budget of £6,000, where they tell every school that, oh, each child gets £6,000 and the school should be able to cope or to provide within that. They can't. So I would say... More than likely. I would say more than likely. And I would say look at kind of an EHCP, it's just having it. It doesn't have to be that your child will need 40 hours of OT and 50 hours of speech and stuff, but it's going to reflect their strengths and their needs, and it's gonna follow them, because they might be doing really well now, then suddenly they move to senior school, and things are really hard, and then you can put it into effect. I've had a lot of kids who we've, we've had a lot of OT hours written into the EHCP, but we get to a certain stage, and they go, actually, Mrs. Bloor, Ms. Anissa, I don't want to come to OT anymore because I'm missing out on these things. And then you go, okay, what are your goals? And okay, fine, let's have six weeks. And you speak to the parent, you speak to the Senko. Let's have a term without OT. We do not take it off the EHCP at that stage. Yeah, because their needs are changing. They are going to need, if you think about that adulthood, job interview skills when they're older. So I would, I mean, I would, yeah, I would love for all your kids to have phenomenal EHCPs, because they are already at a disadvantage, right? Just from that point. Um, so what yeah. age then do you start pushing for that? So it's when they start, you know, you can have, it's when you start noticing. So I would say just keep track of everything that is difficult, everything that they're struggling with. And then when they go to nursery, yeah, um, have them also do that whole thing of, you know, this is what she's doing but all her peers are doing that. And then just start collecting that evidence because it's gonna be when they go to primary school, mm -hmm. reception, that's usually when the differences yeah. are. But more importantly, I think a lot of the differences show up when they go to year one. Yeah, okay. Um, because that's when things change. Suddenly they have to sit still, they can't run outside anymore, it's not free flow. Um, and 
in this country, they have to apparently be writing by the age of four, which is, yeah, I don't agree with that. You know, and so they make them sit down at the age of four. Um, my youngest son, when he went to year one, we tried to year delay him, but when he moved to year one, they, um, his teacher said that he was lazy and he couldn't read, he couldn't write, and all he wanted to do was play outside. And I said, but he's five. Surely that's okay. Um, yeah, so we didn't see eye to eye on that. But anyway, um, yeah. So I would, yeah, I would say just keep an eye on it. Um, did you have a, oh, sorry. Hi, um, just on that case study, that last one that you were showing, the, you're obviously a private OT. Was, is all of that work that you do with it, is that all funded through the EHCP? Every single bit. Wow. And that includes traveling. I mean, we are, I'm quite bad at um, charging for travel, but that includes traveling. That includes going there. It includes having the meetings. It includes the admin time. Um, yeah. How do you manage to convince the local authority <laughs> to do that and to fund that when they try and use NHS services and, you know? Um, so we've had this with her um, as well. And her parents were saying she needs help at the college. They have these timetables. So she was only doing animal handling at certain times. And, you know, because they keep on trying to to move the OT because it's cheaper, because um, they, yeah, it, it is cheaper. Um, and they said, okay, well, w will you go and do these sessions on these days? And they said, no, it's not functional. And we kind of go, but it is functional because she wants to end up working with animals. And they go, yeah, but she can dress herself. And you're like, yeah, but she wants to have a job one day. She wants to leave home. She wants to be independent. And that then again is the parents just going on and on and on and on and ensuring that you have a good OT who you can, who will provide that. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had a case recently where the local authority OT was going to school, phoned me and said, is there any chance you can take over this child's OT because she doesn't want to be seen in school. She doesn't want to be different. Um, and so she took it to the local authority, their OT. Um, and they're still having a discussion. Um, yeah. So you just have to be like super strong and just keep on fighting for it. Um. Hi. Uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, applying for the EHCP. Yeah. Uh, you did mention that uh, your assessment takes part of, uh, takes care of the sensory and physical part of yeah. it. Yeah. So is it like a report? Uh, yeah, what you so do? when we do an assessment, we would, um, you'd ask for an EHCP assessment, which our assessments are generally all the same, that the difference comes in the detail in the reports. So if we then write that report, we will write it out in section B strengths, and you list that. Then you'll go section B needs, and you'll have a whole page for that. Then you, and so you write all of that, but you also give the background. So we'll write about their core strength, their, you know, how they did in the test, the standardized test, but you then give them all that information that will form part of that um, EHCP. So does that come after the application or, I mean, uh, does the council ask you to do it or is it so, the parents who tell uh, who requested? Yeah, it just At depends. At what point? Yeah. So we'll, um, sometimes we have parents who will say, I tried to apply on my own and it was turned down. Um, we want to then apply with all our evidence. So parents will get as much evidence as they can beforehand and then apply. Um, the local authority might come back and say, yeah, great, you've got everything in place. He has a lovely EHCP, doesn't happen very often. Um, or they'll say, no, we won't accept those reports. Um, we will get our own professionals in, okay. and, but they have a time limit. So don't forget that there's a time limit that they have to do everything by. Um, I think it's 20 weeks, um, I think. Um, and so they then have to find a speech therapist, an OT, a physio, an educational psychologist, um, and 
if they can't do it within that time, they generally end up using your information or they just go and, and make the parents appeal. So I would say, yeah, apply. Because also, because it can take so long as well, you don't want the reports to be out of date. Yeah. And that's the other part of things as well. Um, you know, I know some parents who it's been a long time. So apart from the uh, evidence that the SEND officer has collected in school, yeah. we need to have uh, the OT assessment, clinical educational psychologist reports, yeah. so the, and speech and language assessments. Yeah, depending on what it is that your child has difficulties with. Mm. Um, and if you're working with your SENCO, then she will steer you and say kind of these are the areas. Um, the local authority then have to get evidence, so use their own. Quite often they'll not have a speech therapist, for example, and then you'll say, but you don't have a speech therapist. It's because they can't find one, yeah? So they have to get, so quite often they'll do their own assessments. So you end up having a child who is highly over-assessed um, and quite often I also end up at tribunals where the parents have done all the assessments and they then say to the local authority, I refuse you access to my child. You had the chance to do the assessment, you didn't do the assessment, or you did the assessment over the phone, mm. um, you didn't see my child, so no, you are, I'm, I'm not allowing you access. And you know that holds up in court as well. Um, yeah, so I think it's, I would say look at websites, I haven't put them on here, but things, um, I can send you the details, you know, Sendias is really good, um, just an advocate, just reading up and, and, and tr try and work closely with your, with your school if you can. So uh, is your suggestion, uh, should we uh, apply beforehand, before we have any of these reports or do we uh, get these reports and then uh, apply? I would, because I don't, know the case, but I would work with your Senko, like your, the school teacher, and see what they say. Right. Um, if they are from, yeah, yeah, see what they say. No, I mean, uh, the question yeah. is, do we get them done privately or do we get them done through the council? Yeah. Should be. Right. Right. So, yeah. I mean, to give you an example, I've been to a tribunal before where the opposing side brought an OT to the tribunal. She had not met the child. She'd spoken to the mum on the phone for five minutes. She had produced a report based on that. Um, and then contested everything that I had said. Um, which, you know, it's an easy win, <laughs> but it's still heartbreaking that the parents have to go through all of that um, and that the local authorities, you know, um, that, that they can get away with that. Um, yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm just... Um, wondering what your advice for parents in Scotland is because the HCP isn't... Oh my gosh, that's so different. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can put you in touch with someone <laughs> in Scotland um, because the system is, is very different there. So yeah, if you, um, if you email me, I, can, um, I have a number of Scottish um, colleagues Thank you, Anissa. Yeah. I'll pass the details. Yeah. Yeah. That's thank great. you. Cool. Um, anybody else? That was a fantastic talk, and I think really, really useful for cool. all the families to know what the process involves and the hiccups, and you know the difficulties. I mean, I think I probably terms. made it sound easier than it actually is. Mm -hmm. It is, <laughs> you know, and I made it. I, it's hard. Fifty-two weeks. So it's... 52. 52, yeah. yeah. It's supposed to take 20, isn't it? Yeah. And it's a whole year for the child. A whole year, yeah. We're on week 29 and we've not got anywhere. And it's going to be in September. Yeah. 
And it's not uncommon. I mean, sadly, this is all over the country. You hear these stories. Um, and some of the affluent areas, so the area that I work in, is probably one of the worst. But yeah. I've just had um, a tribunal that took over a year, and it does break you. You just got to keep going. It is absolutely heartbreaking, but you get there in the end. But it, it is hard. There's national shortages for Ed Psych, so because of COVID and everything, you could be looking at a year for that. There's a national shortage of OTs. You can't find. OTs on the NHS, like it is at breaking point, but you just got to keep fighting for your children. Mm. Cool. Um, I do. Um, sorry, you. you can move on this way. Yeah. No, I was just going to say because I'm I'm about to go. Um, I I have twenty five copies of my book to give. It's in my car. Um, yes, please. Um, <laughs> so it's not like specific to ACC, but it's just my journey as a parent and yeah, um, I'll go get it in my car. Um, they're not signed, but if you really want me to, I can sign it. <laughs> <laughs> they're still in the box, brand new, which is also as my son, who's studying accounting and finance, has told me, and I've told these guys, it's the worst um, business idea that I've ever had because I write books and I give them away um, <laughs> to parents and I also kind of like hybrid published so I spent money to write a book that I'm giving away and actually you know what's he going to inherit one day um, and I explained he's, inher he, he's inheriting my debt so um, yeah um, but yeah just um, keep going and and the another thing that I didn't say is they Local authorities have a way sometimes of making, and teachers and schools, of making parents feel like they are second rate and they are neurotic and you are just the parent, but actually you are the most important person in that child's professional MDT because you know them better than anyone else. Yeah, so cool. So, That's fantastic. Thank you.